Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Arise and Shine. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. I wanted to share this sign that I have hanging in my house that reminds me every day uh, to be thankful and how blessed that I am. I hope that the Lord has blessed you and given you many things to be thankful for as well. So I wanted to move on today and talk about some things that I really feel God has planted in my heart and I wanted to open in prayer with you. So let's start with that. Dear Lord, we again come before you and we thank you so much that you are our Abba Father, that you hold this world in your hands. We thank you, Lord God, that you are forgiven, forgiving us for all of our sins when we bring them before you and we bring them before you now, that we can spend this time with clean hands and a pure heart in your presence. We ask, Lord God, that you will download more of you and less of us in our lives this day. We thank you for your message in due season. We thank you for your love for us and for equipping us, Lord, for this life that you have blessed each one of us with. And we ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So today I was uh, feeling to share from the book of Deuteronomy, um, a book that Moses wrote uh, toward the end of his long life on earth. It tells us all about the grand history of God's mighty works in Moses' life. In chapter 31, just before Joshua becomes Israel leader, Israel's leader, it says this in uh, verses 1 to 8. It says, When Moses had finished giving these instructions to all the people of Israel, he said, I am now 120 years old, and I am no longer able to lead you. The Lord has told me you will not cross the Jordan River. But the Lord your God himself will cross over ahead of you. He will destroy the nations living there, and you will take possession of their land. Joshua will lead you across the river, just as the Lord promised. The Lord will destroy the nations living in the land, just as he destroyed Sihon and Og, the king of the Amorites. The Lord will hand over to you the people who live there, and you must deal with them as I have commanded you. So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, and do not panic before them. For the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. Wow, isn't that a wonderful promise that we have from God? Just amazing. <clears throat> so, God's word tells us so many times in Deuteronomy about God's promise of never leaving us and his going before us. And now I will fast forward to the book of Ephesians to talk to you about the weapons that God gives us to fight the battles that we face in life. God equips, he prepares, and he delivers. We only need to seek him and put on the armor he has given us to us to see us through in victory. These weapons for warfare are a gift from God to cover us in every battle. The only weapons that we need to ensure our victory. So God's armor is found in Ephesians verse 5. And I'm going to read a portion of that for you right now, starting at verse 10. A final word, be strong in the Lord. Have you heard that before? And in his mighty power, <clears throat> put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm, <clears throat> excuse me, against the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will be standing firm, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. 
For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is God's word. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a little tickle in my throat. I'm just going to take a little sip of water. I think we often forget that we have an enemy who seeks to devour us, and we often just get upset with people or circumstances instead. Ephesians reminds us that we are handpicked and chosen by God, completely forgiven, when we ask it, and it teaches us to trust in his power and his wonderful love. It warns us to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might, to stand firm against the schemes of the evil one, against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places, and to take up the weapons that will benefit in our life. To lay down our worldly weapons and to stand firmly fitted with the armor that God has provided for us. The enemy is not flesh and blood, but rather forces of darkness. The invisible enemy that we often forget is there. We are often tricked to believe the battle is flesh and blood. But oh no, we have an enemy that is real, and he just prowls every day, hoping we will forget he is there. He prowls and sneaks up on us when we least expect it. I had a vision the other day of a ferocious animal attacking its prey. What a scary sight that was. I took away a thought that this is how the enemy attaches himself to us unknowingly and does not let go. His teeth get buried deep within our being and he is determined not to let go. He tries with all his might to devour us. This made me think of the following. I googled animal attacks and learned that in the U.S. each year, 26 people lose their lives in Texas, which is the number one state for animal attacks. 20 more lose their lives in California and another 16 in Florida. This is annually the average. The most dangerous animal species in the U.S. are the brown bears, followed by sharks snakes, black bears, and lastly, alligators. Surely this is not what I would have thought. My number one would have been alligators, I think. In Canada, we have much less incidents of death by animals. But it surprised me that the number one most dangerous animal in Ontario, can you guess what it is? It's the moose. Not black bears and not coyotes, which is what I would have thought. But moose. Moose do not want to be agitated or they will charge you. And they also often cause fatal collisions. The moose. The most interesting thing that I learned from Dr. Google when I was looking this information up was that mosquitoes kill the most people in the world yearly. Can you guess how many? It's actually a million to be exact. Wow, a little tiny mosquito that has the power to kill a million people? That's even more reason for me to ask God when I get to heaven why he invented mosquitoes. And even more, why did he put two of them on the ark with Noah? I learned that when faced with a wild animal that you need to back away slowly and calmly, Stand up tall and make a loud noise and wave your arms. One of my daughters and I went for a hike recently behind Parkwood Hospital in London. It was about 4 p.m. one afternoon, and we were thinking that the coyotes wouldn't be out and about. Well, didn't we find out differently? Yes, we met some. Walking her large boxer bulldog. 
And we had to put all of those tactics to use in practice about backing up and making loud noises and waving our arms. But I found out they actually work. We were not harmed, thank God. When an animal comes in for an attack on its prey, first its eyes watch for focus. Watch, they focus. Its teeth clutch in fierceness. Its body is on guard to fight. And its feet are ready to move the force. Its head is down to fire. The predator is focused, fierce, ferocious, and forceful to overcome its target. The, pred the predator begins by first stalking its prey by moving slowly and quietly, and then suddenly and unexpectedly moves in. Often the prey is unaware of the predator's presence. The predator is poised to pounce after it has been crouching in the weight. Sometimes this is with a, within a few feet of its prey, and it goes unnoticed. It was lurking in the weight in concealment, sometimes camouflaged, so that it can sneak in more easily. I think we can liken these tactics as to how the enemy comes in for an attack on us, and our loved ones as well. But God has given us the armor to protect us all from the enemy's deadly attacks. Isn't that wonderful? So the first part of the armor is the belt of truth. Truth is where it all starts. Without truth, we will never gain victory. Truth is not the most notable, noticeable piece of armor, but it is the most important piece. All the other armor connects to it. Committed to the truth of God is critical for all of us. To know his truth, we need only to study his word and be committed to it. We need to pray and ask God to fill us with his truth daily. And we need to be part of his body, which is his church, to learn, to love, and to serve as Christ commands us to. We all need an earthly shepherd to guide and help us to know God in deeper measures. To be part of corporate worship, prayer, and praise. Think of your church as your family. How can you love them if you never have any relationship with them, or you get to know them, or you only come once in a while like Christmas or Easter? God wants us to be connected as part of his body. How blessed we are to have such a wonderful church. I was reading in Ephesians, and I was going to share that too as well with you about the importance of his church. Uh, just one moment, and I'll find that. And it says here, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. Why would he give gifts to the church if he never intended us to be committed to the church? They are the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists and the pastors and the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Isn't that, isn't that interesting to know? I've heard some people in the past say, well, I can believe in God without going to church. But it clearly shows that God wants us to be part of his body, his church. And we are so blessed to have such a wonderful church. When I started attending, attending London Gospel Temple in the late 90s with my family, I know that God was wanting us there. Every week when Pastor Smith, a much beloved pastor, would preach a message, he would look straight at our family sitting up at the right side of the balcony upstairs. I knew from that that God was wanting our attention. And yes, he got it. I have never noticed Pastor Smith looking in that direction so much after I clued into this. Has God been trying to get your attention? 
In John 8 and 32, it says these this about truth. It says there that the truth will set us free. That's why it's so important to stand with the belt of truth. And Jesus said in John 14 and 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in Psalm 26 and 3, it says there, To teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may live according to your truth. Grant me purity of heart so that I may honor you. I have learned that the enemy's major calling card in this life is, is deception. It comes at us every day from every angle. Most often the person who's being deceived doesn't even know it as it comes in so subtly. By listening to the news or reading social media, we can surely wit witness so much of this deception is happening in the world in which we live, and confusion is running rampant as well. People have gotten away from God's word and instruction, just like the Israelites did, as Moses recorded it in the book of Deuteronomy. I was speaking with my granddaughter a few weeks ago, and we were talking about how God had made us and that we are his, and she tar started telling me about her health studies at school. She said, Grams, they teach us at school that there are 17 sexual types in this world, and they encourage us to discover which one we are. We need to pick one of 17. Wow, cunning confusion at its best for young people developing. So many fall into these false teachings that come in through a trusted door like a teacher. Do you think the enemy is at work there too? We need to be reminded of what God's word says about this subject to know his truth and how that this will set the world free again. I also see so much hate in this world when these deceptions take hold and others fall prey to them. But we need to be reminded then the greatest command is love. And we must surely must love those who are being deceived. Love needs to be our measuring stick. This, however, does not mean that we need to accept these deceptive tactics, but we need to pray daily for God's truth to prevail in each and every household and school in our nation. Yes, sometimes God will have us step up for him and bring correction. But prayer is the greatest tool of all, and everything is to be done in love. Have you prayed lately for those who are being deceived? Do you carry a burden for someone who is deceived, and your heart is aching for them? I remind you that God tells us to cast our cares and not to carry them in 1 Peter 5 and 7. It says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. He clearly tells us to stand firm in truth and pray without ceasing to see his kingdom come. Oh, how easy it is to become a burden bearer for those that we love. But I have found that carrying burdens will have devastating impacts on our health sleepless nights, and sickness, to name a few. Don't hang on to the burdens, but pray and trust. So how do we apply the truth, the belt of truth? We pursue the truth on a specific topic, but we don't forget to grab hold of the whole scripture. Don't just study the parts that come easily for devotional reading. Press into the whole counsel of God's word. We also can pray for God's word. Use the tr word of truth as a template to guide our prayers. And we can memorize the truth for quicker access when we need it. Cover your world with scripture 
as post-it notes, screensavers, decor, and anything that will help you remember God's word in a spiritual battle. So the second part of the armor that I wanted to talk about was the breastplate of righteousness, which protects our hearts. It covers our heart, and in Psalm 4 and 23, God says there, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. God has given us this piece of armor. Righteousness is right side up living, not shaded, dark, upside down life. I have been cleaning my parents' farm up for the past couple of years, and my sister and I were in a large grain bin together, moving some debris out to a dumpster, and this debris had been stored there for some years. All at once, I heard my sister start to scream so loud, and she ran out of the door. She told me when I ran out to join her that she was never going back in there. She had lifted up an old rubber tire, and a huge rat had run out from under it. I still have goosebumps. That rat had moved into that nice, dark, dirty place to take up residence. Unrighteous living is also like that. It will encourage dark areas in our lives for unwanted evil things to tar start to take up residence. Righteousness, of course, is not being perfect, but living, but living in alignment with God's word, aligning our behavior and actions with God's word. Don't let the enemy trick you into being jealous or divisive, or comparative to others, as these surely are not are some of the tactics that he tries to use. So how do we apply the breastplate of righteousness to us? We soak in and obey the instructions from the Lord. If there's an area of life that feels like it's getting easily tangled up in sin, ask a church leader to share some scriptural truths that might help you walk in the Lord's plan more fully. You can also ask a trusted person to pray for you if you're struggling with obedience. All Christians struggle, but none were meant to struggle alone. We make easy targets for the enemy when we do not obey God, and we keep our struggles secret. The next piece of the armor is the gospel of peace. And with your feet fitted with the readiness for the gospel, from the gospel of peace in Ephesians, Ephesians 6 and 15. This means that peace is an attitude of the Lord's very person and character. In Greek, peace means oneness or wholeness. The gospel, which means good news, is the forgiveness of sins and the access to the one and the two and the oneness with God through faith in Christ. This oneness with the Lord produces peace. Ephesianly, Ephesians repeatedly reminds us to stand firm. One of the easiest ways for the enemy to succeed in shaking us loose from standing firm is to tempt us with worry. Been there, done that. When we carry anxiousness and worry with us, we are robbed of peace. But the gospel of peace keeps our feet anchored and standing firm. So how can we apply the peace? We can ask, the, ask daily for the Lord to remind us of his gospel work on our behalf. Set your security and identity in his work and not in yours. Surround yourself with scripture about the truth of your place with Christ into your heart and remove the input that steals your sense of security in Christ. See, keeping all those scriptures underlined in your Bible or on sticky notes or artwork in your house surely helps you to be reminded and to walk more assuredly in the peace that God wants to give you. Put on those shoes of peace. Then comes the shield of faith. 
In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith. And what that means. When Paul wrote this message, Roman soldiers carried shields that were covered with heavy animal hide. Before a battle, they would dip their shields into the water so that when fiery darts hit them, the wet hide would extinguish the darts. In a similar way, a Christian's shield of faith needs to be regularly dipped in the water of God's word to be replenished and fully functional because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Another good reason to come to church. How to apply it. If your faith feels less confident than you wish it did, ask God to increase your faith. It says that in Mark 9, 24. Find verses that feed your faith and fill your world with them. You can stick them on the dashboards of your car. And set your faith on God's character and not on the circumstance. We so easily set our faith on the circumstance when we look through the eyes of the world, but set it on God's character. Then comes the helmet of salvation. To me, this is another very important one. We need to take the helmet of salvation. Salvation comes from the moment we place our trust in Jesus' death and resurrection as the payment for our sin. But salvation is also worked out through a lengthy process of sanctification in our lives. The helmet of salvation, like the breastplate of righteousness, rests on the work of Christ to save us, but also involves us as we journey with the Lord and allow him to work that salvation into every part of our thought life. The battlefield of our mind is the primary place the spiritual battle is fought. The Lord works his freeing truth into our perspectives while the enemy fights for strongholds to bind us in John 10 and 10. Have you had that little character sitting on your shoulder talking lies into your head saying this will never happen or this is impossible? We have to hang on to the helmet of salvation. We have to wear that tightly so that we will know that the battlefield is in the mind and we have to plant in our mind the Lord's truth and what his word says. So it says in Romans 12 and 2 to wash your mind with the renewing of God's word. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to rep, to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And next, the armor is the sword of the Spirit, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, what it means and how Jesus applied it. The explanation of this piece of armor is right there in the verse. It is the word of God. And it is the only piece of armor that is both defensive and offensive. We are tempted. The most effective weapon that God has given us as believers is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Jesus modeled this so beautifully during his temptation in the wilderness, when the evil one tempted him, and after the temptation came against him, Jesus used the sword of the Spirit in Luke 4, 1-13. When the devil tempted him three times, Jesus responded with the truth of God's word every single time. Keep that truth of God's word close to your heart. So why did I feel to share this message on armor today? Well, I believe that God wanted us to hear this message for this season. A season where I have spoken to some lately whose families sadly are under attack of the evil one. I believe that God has set all of us up to sabotage those plans and to see our families and loved ones through through and brought out from under the tactics of the enemy, and that the enemy's plan will be destroyed. 
The enemy has stalked and pounced and sunk his teeth in and angrily holds some of our loved ones captive. He is shaking them to and fro. But, but, but God will give us focus, fierceness, and a force to see them all set free. His word. We have a hotline to communicate with the real commander chief of this world, our almighty God, and the weapons of his warfare to win this battle. He has done it before, and he will do it again. Stay on your knees, seek him, walk with him, listen to him, and dwell in his presence. But most of all, trust him. You nor your loved ones will ever be defeated. Jesus bought and paid for us all already and delivered us all on that cross. And yes, it looked at first like the enemy had won when Jesus died. But oh yes, on day three, on day three, he arose. Yes, he arose. He arose. Yes, he rose. Amen and amen. Your freedom is in Christ. I just wanted to end with prayer. And then I have this song that God put on my heart and it's called Jesus, I Believe. And I wanted to read the words, but click on the video, the YouTube after, and you can worship to the Lord and hear it um, and, and the music part of it. It's just wonderful. But Lord, I just thank you, Lord God, that you equip us for every battle and that we will never be defeated. I thank you that we are bought and paid with the price of your precious blood. Help us to walk forth in trust and faith and hope, wearing our armor, Lord God, that we will win the battle that is set before us, Lord God. We thank you that your word and your promises are yes and amen. And we love you and we ask this in Jesus' name. So the song, the words are, Jesus, I believe. And it says, I want to walk with you, Jesus. Feel your presence and know you're near. I want to see you, Jesus, move in power and cast out fear. I need to hear you now. I need to know it's you. I'm standing on your promises. I know your word is true. You're bigger than what I see. It's you, and it's in exchange for me. Because even the impossible can be reality. Jesus, I believe. Jesus, I believe. I want to see what you're saying, speaking life to what is dead. And I want to cling to you, Jesus, uh, hanging on your every breath. And I want to cling to you, Jesus, hanging on to your every breath. I need to hear you now. I need to know it's you. I'm standing on your promises. I know your words are true. You're bigger than what I see, that it's you in exchange for me, because even the impossible is your reality. Jesus, I believe. So let your kingdom come and let your will be done here on earth, just like it is in heaven. God, let your kingdom come and let your will be done right here on earth, just like it is in heaven. I want to hear you now. I need to know it's you. I'm standing on your promises. I know your word is true. You're bigger than what I see. It's you in exchange for me, because even the impossible is your reality. I need to hear you now. I need to know it's you. I'm standing on your promises. I know your words are true. You're bigger than what I see. It's you in exchange for me, because even the impossible is your reality. God, even the impossible is your reality. Jesus, I believe. Help my unbelief, God. Jesus, I believe. I hope you've been blessed today and surely click on that song and worship. It is wonderful to hear it um, sang rather than read. But I just ask that the Lord will bless you and keep you and that his face will shine upon you until we meet again. Be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen.